Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokémon Platinum using only flying-type Pokémon. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. Flying-type Pokémon, in general, are pretty good. They tend to have decent variety in their secondary typings, resulting in good coverage. Platinum, in particular, has a long list of pretty good flying-type encounters, so you might expect this challenge to be a bit on the easier side, certainly easier than Platinum Fire-types. However, Sinnoh is notably anti-bird, given that the first gym is Rock-type, the seventh gym is Ice-type, the eighth gym is Electric-type, and a lot of major battles have Pokémon with Ice-type coverage. So, it's not as easy as you might think based solely on the list of potential encounters. Oh, also, I'm pretty tired of using Gyarados and Nuzlocks for now, so I decided to just not use one for this playthrough. Makes it a little more interesting. But one thing I'm not tired of is talking about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Oh, how I've missed you, Skillshare ad segues. Welcome home. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, and video editing. People are always asking me for advice and tips on how to start creating YouTube videos. And one of the most important skills, especially early on, is learning how to edit your own videos. Just about everything I know about video editing came from Jordi Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class. Through Skillshare, you can take classes like Jordi's that will be invaluable to your creative journey, whatever that may be. The best part about Skillshare classes is that they are optimized to put your learning first. There's no commitment or timeline to finish the class. You can skip individual lessons if you're not interested in that specific topic, and all classes are completely ad-free. Everyone knows that ads are just the worst. So if you want to give Skillshare a try, you can use the link in the description below to get 30% off a year of Skillshare's premium membership. That's three months free, the best deal they've ever offered. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. Just as a quick reminder before we start though, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, now let's see how this goes. As always, the journey begins by choosing one of three potential starters, none of which are flying type, so the choice is relatively arbitrary. I go with Chimchar so that a rival will have Piplup, since that's the only final starter that isn't weak to flying type attacks. After going through the early game tutorial, I head to Route 202 and catch a Starly, who will be the unofficial official starter of the run. I name him Jet Blue. Jet Blue has a calm nature, which is a pretty atrocious nature for a Starly to have, but whatever. And so begins our whirlwind adventure. Jet Blue and I against the world. He flew me to places I've never been, but we didn't go at it alone. Right away, I head to Ravage Path and catch our second team member, a Zubat. I name him British, and the jolly old chap joins the squad. Then I head to Route 204 where I catch a Wormpole, an encounter that makes this run possible without an incredible amount of luck. I name our Wormpole Air France. With a few levels, she evolves. Air France can evolve into either Silcoon or Cascoon, but only Silcoon eventually evolves into a Flying-type Pokémon, so it's pretty lucky that Air France does indeed evolve into Silcoon. Had she not, I likely would have just caught another Wormpole, since Wormpoles that don't evolve into Beautifly would technically not be eligible encounters. Anyways, before continuing, we have to complete the first fight against our rival, who is aptly named Delta. JetBlue is a tad overleveled for this fight, so he's able to just wing attack both of Barry's ducks into the ground without even taking any damage. Suck eggs, Delta. Seriously, suck eggs. With a bit more leveling up, Air France lay evolves into Le Beautifly. More on her in a second. JetBlue also gets to the level cap of level 14 and evolves into Staravia. Oh my god! That is truly an intimidating Pokemon. Definitely wouldn't want to cross paths with one of these guys in a dark alley. Ugh. Anyways, anyways, now it's time for Rourke, who is a pretty big problem for our flying types to deal with. The downside of doing monotypes in Sinnoh is that Rourke's team makes some of them essentially impossible. And that is almost the case for the flying monotype challenge, if not for Air France. See, Air France knows Absorb, which is super effective to and abuses Rourke's Pokémon's naturally frail special defense. The downside is that Absorb only has 20 base power, and Beautifly is not what I'd call a special sweeper, so we aren't picking up too many one-hit kills. And because the level cap is so low, you'd need a very large amount of EVs to actually change her special attack stat, and that doesn't even really change the damage calcs. 
so I will need to get a wee bit lucky and dodge some crits. Rourke leads with Geodude, and that goober actually does go down to a single absorb, so at least that's cool. This also gives me enough EXP to level up to level 15, which is fine according to my rule set. So, second is Onyx, and we manage to outspeed and hit an absorb. This doesn't quite get the kill though. Fortunately, Onyx has the strength of a room temperature stick of butter, so Rock Throw isn't enough for a kill despite being four times effective into Air France. We did have to dodge a critical hit there though. Rourke then heals with a potion on the next turn, so I take it as a chance to use Harden in order to improve my chances against the Cranidos in the back. Then a second Absorb finishes off Onyx, and Air France gains a huge chunk of HP back. So last is the aforementioned Cranidos. He actually doesn't know a Rock-type move, so as long as we dodge a few critical hits, things will be fine. Especially if Air France decides to be an absolute badass and fire off a critical hit Absorb. Cranidos just uses Pursuit and Retaliation, so on the next turn a second Absorb knocks out Cranidos and seals the deal. That was much easier than I was expecting it to be. That's batch number one. From here I can head to Floroma Town, where I get to start doing Honey Tree Roulette. There are two flying type encounters that I can get from Honey Trees, Combi slash Vespiquen, and a male Burmy that evolves into Mothin. I basically need to just re-roll Honey Trees until I get one of those Pokemon. In Floroma Meadows, I eventually find a Combi, but he's male, aka he's a piece of garbage because he can't evolve into Vespiquen. Since there are plenty of opportunities to get other honey tree encounters, I decide to just kill this one so that I can try for a female combi in another honey tree. This is a pretty common tactic in Nuzlocke, since based on most interpretations of the Species Clause, the Species Clause is only in effect if you successfully catch the Pokémon. Though of course it is all subjective. Anyways, Mars time. She leads with Zubat, and I lead with my much stronger Zubat. A few wing attacks take her out as she's forced to retaliate with just a weak bite. Brugly is next, and pretty scary at this point in the game. I switch to JetBlue and get off an Intimidate as Perugly goes for a Fake Out. Then Perugly goes for a Scratch, and JetBlue hits a Growl to lower her attack again, meaning that we really only have to worry about critical hits now. Which is exactly what Perugly gets two turns later, though JetBlue does manage to survive with just 3 HP. Since Perugly's Orenberry activates, she has a good amount of HP left, so I have to switch to Air France on a very weak Feint attack. Then I tank another faint attack and hit a stun spore to slow Perugly down. That's ultimately not worth it though, because Gust manages to finish off Perugly on the next turn in one shot, so I was just risking a miss with stun spore there for nothing. But Air France pulled through yet again, winning us the battle. And now that the nameless little girl and her nameless papa are saved, I can patiently wait for it to be Friday in real life so that Drifloon appears in front of Valley Windworks. I successfully catch the Drifloon and name him Westjet. Then I start checking the honey tree on Route 205. After a few rounds of ignoring Cherubi and Wormpools, I actually find another combi, and this one manages to be female. Which is pretty awesome, and pretty lucky. Given how difficult it is to get one, I've never actually used a Vespiquen before. So I'm really excited, since she's a really cool Pokemon with a lot of utility. I name the combi Qantas, and she joins the team as member number 5. Now we have to head into the depths of Eterna Forest. In Diamond and Pearl, you can catch Murkrow here, but for whatever reason in Platinum, you can't. Murkrow and Mistrevis just can't be caught at all in Platinum. I've always found that super stupid when Game Freak just removes a handful of Pokémon from the third version of a game. Very annoying. We can get Hoot Hoot here, but I do make sure to wait until after I've helped this hippie get through Eterna Forest, so that she doesn't accidentally kill the Hoot Hoot with her Chansey. But then I end up killing the Hoot Hoot. Fortunately, you can also get Hoot Hoot on Route 211, so it's not the end of the world. I name the second Hoot Hoot Lufthansa, and she joins the team. By the time we get to Gardenia, our team is looking pretty stacked. British has evolved into Golbat, Qantas has evolved into Vespiquen, and Lufthansa has evolved into Noctowl. But none of that even matters, because Air France is completely unhinged and out for blood. Gardenia's Turtwig just gets blown away by a few gusts. He does manage to set up a Reflect before Gardenia also wastes a Super Potion here, but then on the next turn, a third Gust finishes off the Turtwig. Cherim is second, and she too goes down to two Gusts as Air France just brushes off a Grass Knot. Roserade is last. She outspeeds to hit a Stun Spore, but our held Cherry Berry cures the Paralysis. Air France then fires off a Stun Spore of her own. This lets her outspeed to hit a Hard Gust on the next turn, as Roserade misses a Stun Spore like a chump with a capital C. A second Gust from Air France misses out on the kill, so Roserade's Citrus Berry activates and she connects with a Stun Spore. So now it's just an RNG war. 
Roserade hits a weak magical leaf, and then Air France gets fully paralyzed. Seems about right. But before I get the chance to complain about paralysis shenanigans, Air France tanks another magical leaf, and then finishes off Roserade with a critical hit gust. Kinda weird to go into battle with something named Air France and not having to instantly surrender, but hey, that's now two gym badges soloed with just a beautifly. Next up is the fight against Commander Jupiter, whose Skun tank is always pretty tough. She leads with Zubat, but now that British is a Golbat, it's pretty easy for him to take out Zubat with two wing attacks. The bloke does have to get hit by a wing attack, but that's hardly a dent. Skuntank comes in second, so British hits her with a Confuse Ray, which instantly pays off as Skuntank hits herself in Confusion. Then I switch to Air France as Skuntank snaps out of Confusion and hits a Smokescreen. Skuntank then hits another Smokescreen, so it's rather unsurprising that Air France's Stun Spore misses. Skuntank then hits a hard Night Slash, which actually would have just barely killed if it crit, and then we miss another Stun Spore. Lame. I switch out to Qantas, who kinda tanks a Night Slash. Then Skuntank goes for another Night Slash, which again would have killed if it crit. Qantas then retaliates with a Bug Bite, which lets her do decent damage and also eat Skuntank's Citrus Berry. Skuntank then goes for a Poison Gas, which is actually great because we have a Petra Berry, so the Poison gets cured and Qantas fires off another Bug Bite for free. It looks like another Bug Bite will seal the deal here, so we just need to dodge one more critical hit. Which we do not. So, sadly our queen falls. JetBlue is able to come in and finish off the Skun Tank before she gets another critical hit. So Jupiter only claims one life, and the battle is won. But so much for getting to use Vespiquen, I guess. Rest in bees, Qantas. No, I will not stop making that pun every time I lose a bee Pokemon. Even if it becomes annoying. <laughs> uh. Well, as one life ends, another begins. Cynthia gives me an egg, which hatches into a Togepi. I name him United. And then I discover that United has the ability Hustle. And I am just so sick of getting Hustle Togepi. Like why? Why does every Togepi I have get this stupid garbage ass ability? Every. Single. One. I hate it so much. Despite my hatred for this Togepi, I do successfully Stockholm Syndrome him until he likes me enough to evolve into Togetic. But man, I still hate him. However, I don't hate British, who evolves into Crobat. His moveset is a bit wanting in earlier generations, but Crobat is still a filthy Pokemon for Nuzlocks. So, that's a nice addition to the team. And I'm about to get another nice addition to the team in the form of a Gligar from Route 206, who I named Southwest. Although not quite as good as in ROM hacks where she gets the ability Poison Heal, Glysaur is still an incredibly amazing Pokemon due to her defensive bulk and typing. Southwest will obviously be replacing United, who gets mercilessly dumped in the box. I hope it's cold in there, buddy. Maybe if you hustle a bit, you can warm yourself up. Okay, time for Fantina. And British is hungry. Like the unstoppable Pac-Man before him, he just nom-noms his way through Fantina's entire team. It's actually pretty ridiculous. Fantina's Miss Magius has Psybeam, so theoretically she's a bit of an issue, but even a crit doesn't kill British from full HP because he's fairly bulky, so it is safe to stay in for at least one Psybeam. So British takes out the Miss Magius before she can get off a second Psybeam. And Haunter can't really do much damage either, so she's easy to take out as well. That's now three gyms and three solo sweeps, though admittedly I did get pretty lucky with this one. After that, it's time for another fight against Delta. He leads with Staravia, which is really annoying because he has Double Team, Endeavor, and Quick Attack. I start with British. Thanks to Intimidate, Wing Attack isn't a two-hit kill, and Staravia gets off a Double Team. I go for a Bite on the next turn so that Staravia doesn't get low enough to use Endeavor. He then retaliates with a weak Wing Attack. Fortunately, the Double Team ends up being a complete waste of time because British then connects with a Wing Attack on the next turn and knocks out Staravia. Ponyta comes out next, and I figure there's no downside to staying in, so I just hit a few wing attacks as Ponyta goes for Ember. Unfortunately, the second wing attack leaves Ponyta with a sliver, and then Ponyta's second Ember burns British. This will be bad in a second, but for now a third wing attack finishes off Ponyta as British grows to level 28. Now here's where it gets bad, because Prinplup comes out. And we don't have a great way of quickly killing this little guy. British has decent special defense, but because I lost a bunch of HP and got burned, he's basically useless. Big mistake given that Southwest is completely useless against Prinplup and could have easily one-shot Ponyta with Earthquake. I go to Air France who takes way more damage from a Bubble Beam than I was expecting. 
Unfortunately, now that we're in the mid game, the enemy Pokemon are really starting to catch up to Beautifly's mediocre stats. I'm at risk to a crit here, so I decide to switch to JetBlue, who also takes a shit ton of damage from Bubble Beam. Who would have thought that this dang Penguin would be so strong? But I guess our team is pretty weak in terms of special defense. United is cackling from the box. Lufthansa has decent special bulk though, so I decide to bring him in next. Only for Primplup to get a freaking critical hit Bubble Beam. So it's time for some Hail Marys. I start with a Hypnosis, which thankfully connects. Then I start hammering away with Confusion. We get lucky and I hit a critical hit on the first turn, but the thrill is a bit offset by Primplup getting a one turn wake up and hitting another hard Bubble Beam. This is looking pretty bad, folks. I go for another Hypnosis and get lucky enough to put Primplup back to sleep. And then I start hammering away with Confusion again. Printplup sleeps for two turns this time, so I do get off a of Confusion, but now Printplup is in Torrent range, so Bubble Beam is doing even more damage. Lufthansa manages to avoid the crit, but now if we miss a Hypnosis here, he'll go down. And we'd actually need two turns of sleep anyways, since another weak Confusion isn't taking this guy out. What I do next is objectively the wrong play, because Driftblim is a far superior Pokemon to Noctowl, but I rarely get to use Noctowl, and I feel like I've been using Driftblim a lot lately. So, for the sake of some variety in my challenge runs, I decide to bring in Westjet for a sack. Westjet does survive a Bubble Beam, but a Gust won't kill Printplup from this range. So I give Westjet one chance to survive by going for Minimize. But Printplup connects with a Bubble Beam, and Westjet falls with a pop. This sacrifice does let me bring in Air France, who's able to finish off the Evil Penguin with a Mega Drain. So, last for Delta is Roselia. Air France takes her out with two Gusts, as Roselia just hits a Soft Poison Sting. That wins us the battle, but it does come at the expense of another Feathered Friend. Actually, neither of the two Pokémon that have died so far have had feathers, but the alliteration of Feathered Friend was too good not to say. Well, with that, we get access to Route 209, where I can catch a male Burmy from a Honey Tree. So Valeris soon evolves into Mothim. I don't think I end up using Valeris in any major battles for this video, but he becomes a staple to the team in many random battles that I won't be mentioning. So I do just want to take the time to give him a shout out. Thanks for all the hard work that will go unseen, Valeris. Anyways, I also head to Route 214 where I pick up a Razor Fang, and then I use it to evolve Southwest into Glysaur, a truly spectacular Pokemon for reasons I already mentioned. Want an example? Southwest essentially single-handedly eviscerates Maylene's team with a combination of Earthquake and Roost. She does get the Intimidate assist from JetBlue at the beginning to lower Metatite's attack, but that was more flashy than it was necessary. Southwest is just too bulky. Even critical hits don't do much. A fighting type gym was never going to be that difficult for our flying types to deal with, but Stab Earthquake certainly makes Lucario much easier to manage. That's badge number 4. Next, I head to Pastoria City. Along the way, I encounter a Wingull on Route 213. Pelipper doesn't get Drizzle in this generation, but it's still a phenomenal Pokémon. I know I've been using Pelipper in a lot of my challenges as well, so it's a little hypocritical to sack Drifloon and still use Pelipper, but Pelipper is too useful to pass up, since he is our only Pokémon that takes neutral damage from Ice-type moves. Other than Gyarados, which I don't want to use, and Mantine, which I can't get without breaking the Monotype challenge and catching a Remoraid to evolve a Mantike. So, welcome to the team, Wingle. I name him American, and we finally get a Pokémon with a good nature. Modest is phenomenal here. In the Great Marsh, I get a chance at catching Yanma. Now, viewers of the randomizer nuzlocke I did a while back will know that I had a short-lived fascination with a Yanma named Lil Fly, and I've been eager to use a Yanma ever since. The scary thing is that catching Pokémon in the Great Marsh before they flee is a total crapshoot, but I believe that Lil Fly and I are destined to be reunited. You know, it's moments like this that you realize that life is just a sick, sadistic game that no one asked to play. We're all just sacks of meat moving on a preordained track with no control of what happens or why it happens. It's all just meaningless. Whatever. Time to take our existential angst out on Crash or Wake. He leads with Gyarados and I lead with the newly evolved American. Gyarados hits a soft bite and then American retaliates with a shockwave, which he can learn for some reason. It doesn't one-shot, but it is a lot of damage. Crasher Wake then goes for the rare AI switch to Quagsire as American gets off a roost. This thing is always annoying because his moves can be pretty unpredictable. A Protect says Rock Tomb, so I switch to Southwest, but Quagsire of course just goes for a Yawn. 
I predict a Water Pulse here, so I go back to American, and I actually get lucky enough to dodge a Rock Tomb. So I go for a Protect, because we can probably stall out Rock Tombs here if we need to. Then I go for a Water Pulse, which does good damage as Rock Tomb misses again. Rock Tomb. Terrible move. Never rely on it. Another Water Pulse brings Quag into the red, as he finally connects with a weak Rock Tomb. Wake uses his Hyper Potion, so I hit another Water Pulse. Then I go for a Roost, as Quagsire misses a third Rock Tomb. So it's another Water Pulse. Quagsire seems to get tired of missing, so he uses Yawn. I don't want to fall asleep here, so I switch to Southwest on a Rock Tomb. Then I kill the Quagsire with an Earthquake. Finally. Floatzel comes out next and knows Ice Fang, so I switch to American. Freeze would be really bad here, but thankfully it doesn't happen. I then switch to JetBlue to get off an Intimidate as he gets hit by a Crunch. So now it's back to American as Floatzel misses an Ice Fang, making Crasher Wake the unluckiest sucker in Sinnoh. After another Crunch, American roosts back up to full HP. Then we tank another Crunch and fire off a Shockwave. Thanks to Floatzel's Citrus Berry, the second Shockwave after another Crunch is not enough for the kill. So Wake heals as we fire off yet another Shockwave. We tank another Crunch, which does get the defense drop, and then Roost and a Citrus Berry bring American back to full HP. Floatzel then gets a critical hit Crunch, which also gets the defense drop, but Wake's luck has been cashed in a little too late. Floatzel falls to the follow-up Shockwave. Last is the low health Gyarados, so I switch out to British, tank a bite, and then kill him with a wing attack, which crits to add insult to injury. With that, Crasher Wake has been defeated, and we get badge number 5. At this point, I can get access to the northern foggy part of Route 210, where I can catch a Swablu. In the northern part of Route 210, you can get a Scyther, but I decided that I'd rather have Swablu instead, since I've also been using Scyther a lot lately. But then I double check the encounter tables and find out that you can catch Scyther from Route 215 as well. So I, I do that. And Allegiant joins the team, though I won't be able to evolve her into Caesar. I also get the Swablu from Route 210 and name her Frontier, though she won't be in the video. From here, we enter the part of the game that might as well be called Sucks to have an Ice type weakness, because in pretty short succession, we have to fight Cyrus, Candace, Cyrus again, and Cyrus again again. All of these battles have very strong, very fast ice types that make the lives of my feathery friends a living hell. Cyrus's Haunch Crow is also pretty hard to face off against, but at least in the first fight against Cyrus, he only has Sneasel and Murkrow, so they're much more manageable. Along the way through this part of the game, I also catch a Chatot, who will be the final encounter in this playthrough, though I will never use him either. I name him Finair, and he goes into the box. Then, it's time for the fight against Byron for badge number 6. In theory, Steel types should be kinda hard for our flying types to handle, but it's Byron? Southwest just kills Magneton with an Earthquake. Steelix is second, so we switch to American on an Ice Fang, and then we one-shot him with a Surf. Then it's back to Southwest against Bastiodon. Since Southwest has pretty mediocre attack IVs, Earthquake isn't a guaranteed kill, which means I do have to play around Metal Burst a bit. I set up Sword Stances as Bastiodon goes for Iron Defenses until he makes the mistake of going for a Taunt, which gives me the 1-up. So after that, a single Earthquake brings down the Mighty Beast, winning us the always easy 6 gym badge. Okay, now let's talk about Candace. Her Ice types are pretty tricky since all of my Pokemon except American are very weak to Ice type moves. Her Frostlass in particular is tough because we don't have an easy way to take her out, and her Snow Cloak ability adds an extra complication. Plus, American special defense is pretty low, so Neutral Blizzard still does a ton of damage to him. Fortunately, Candace leads with a Sneasel, whose only Ice type move is a weak priority Ice Shard. This gives us the perfect opportunity to set up with a Legion who gets access to Swords Dance and can hit all of Candace's Ice types for super effective damage with Brick Break, except for Frostlass. However, Allegiant can also learn Aerial Ace, which never misses and gets a Technician boost so that it effectively has 90 base power. I can also have Allegiant hold a Yachi Berry to reduce the damage of a single super effective Ice type attack by half, meaning that it is impossible for Sneasel to kill me, even if she gets two critical hits with Ice Shard. She ends up just going for Aerial Ace on the first turn, which is fine, because she can only ever get off one Aerial Ace thanks to Allegiant naturally outspeeding her. From here, Allegiant is able to one-shot all of Candace's Pokemon. The only way that this could have gone poorly is if Sneasel did get the double critical hit, and then Hale finished us off. Though given that Frostlass comes out before Obama Snow, I think we still would have been fine, since we'd only take one turn of Hale Chip anyways. 
So, that's badge number 7. Okay, now it's time for the last two fights with Cyrus. We can go ahead and skip the second Cyrus fight, since it's just a slightly easier version of the one that's coming up next. We also have a double battle with our rival against Mars and Jupiter on top of Spear Pillar. Just as a note here, I am using this Bib Barrel for the 6 billion HMs you need to get to the top of Mount Cornet. He won't be used in battle, but if it makes you feel any better, here. He's a flying type now. For the first 80% or so of this double battle, I just spam Choice Spec Surfs with American, which kills a lot of Mars's, Jupiter's, and our rival's Pokemon. Eventually, we get to the point where it's just Perugly and Skuntank left for Mars and Jupiter, and Delta is left with Empoleon. The unstoppable moron that is our rival Delta decides to swagger Skuntank, giving her an attack boost at the expense of confusing her. When this happened, I was pretty pissed, since a critical hit Night Slash will now do an insane amount of damage. But somehow it actually works out, as Skuntank just hits herself in confusion three times in a row. And it's a good thing that she did, because Southwest gets put to sleep by a Hypnosis from Perugly, and takes the world's longest power nap before being able to finally wake up and finish off the Skuntank with an Earthquake. Empoleon also manages to hang on and knock out the Perugly with a Metal Claw, letting Delta avoid a wipe by what looks like exactly 1 HP. It seems that this battle against Mars and Jupiter held us off just long enough for Cyrus to start his monologue that threatens to plunge Sinnoh into the depths of the underworld. Time to figure out how to stop him. His team is really tough. Obviously, there's the Weavile with Ice Punch, which is super scary, but all his other Pokémon are also pretty fast and pretty strong. Gyarados knows Ice Fang, Crobat has status moves, and Honchkrow is just really strong with Drill Peck. So I have to think long and hard to figure out a plan for how to do this. I do come up with a plan, but it requires swallowing my pride and asking for help from the person I hate the most. I hate having to rely on stupid United with his stupid hustle ability, but there's no other option, and even with this one, I do need to avoid being unlucky. Which I'm pretty bad at. I evolve United into Togekiss, train him up a bit, and then head into the Distortion World. Doing the Distortion World once is cool, but at this point, after so many playthroughs, it's just so tedious. But eventually, we get to Cyrus, and our final showdown begins. Cyrus leads with Houndoom, so I lead with Southwest. She outspeeds the Houndoom and instantly knocks him out with an Earthquake. Everything I know about Gen 4 AI here, which admittedly is all secondhand information, tells me that Gyarados should be the one that comes out next, since he has a stab super effective move in Waterfall, and he's immune to Southwest's stab ground type moves. But for whatever reason, Weavile comes out instead. I guess times 4 stab takes precedence. Or maybe Cyrus's AI in Vanilla Platinum is different than the AI in ROM hacks, which is where most of the AI logic research is done. Who knows? Either way, this means we gotta dodge some crits and some freezes. I switch in United, hoping Weavile goes for a fake out. But he goes for Ice Punch. United is holding a Yachi Berry though, so as long as Weavile doesn't crit or freeze this next one, we should live it. Weavile hits Ice Punch, and United survives, letting him fire off an Aura Sphere, which ignores his stupid hustle ability and always connects, taking out Weavile in one shot. Gyarados comes out second for Cyrus, so I switch to American on a Waterfall. Then, to my surprise, we actually outspeed as American goes for a Stockpile, letting him shrug off an Ice Fang. Then, American goes for a Roost, making Ice Fang do very little damage since Roost does remove our Flying type for the rest of the turn. American then fires off a very strong Shockwave as Gyarados goes for another Ice Fang. On the next turn, I get a smidge greedy and go for a Stockpile, meaning that we'd definitely be dead to a crit there. But since he doesn't crit, my greedy play goes unpunished as I get to roost back to full HP on the turn that Gyarados recharges. And then a Shockwave knocks him out. Next is Honchkrow, so I stay in and go for a Surf. Honchkrow hits a hard Drill Peck in retaliation, but then a second Surf finishes him off. And so last is Crobat. He starts with an Air Slash, which instantly flinches American. So now we're at risk to a critical hit. So I switch to Southwest on another Air Slash. Then, Crobat hits yet another Air Slash, which triggers Southwest Citrus Berry. We then retaliate with a Rock Tomb to lower Crobat's speed. Then, we outspeed to hit another Rock Tomb as Crobat hits a Confuse Ray. So, after that, I switch out to British for a Mirror Match. Air Slash does really good damage since it crits. And now that British is at risk to another crit, I switch to JetBlue on yet another Air Slash. This one thankfully doesn't crit, so I then just go for a Fly, which connects on the next turn and takes out Crobat winning us the final fight against Benjamin Button. Cynthia heals my Pokémon, and then it's time to fight Giratina. 
but as usual by Fight Giratina, I mean that I show them the way of pacifism and save the world by refusing to engage. So, with the world saved, our gym campaign continues. Volkner is working through his depression inside the Sunny Shore Lighthouse, so I have to go talk to him there before he'll actually challenge me to a gym battle. But doing that is ultimately more challenging than the battle itself. Platinum Volkner is completely destroyed by any ground-type Pokémon, and Southwest fits the bill. We do need to set up a Swords Dance so that Earthquake is a guaranteed kill on Luxray, but Jolteon is very easy to set up on, since he can only use Iron Tail and Quick Attack into ground-type Pokémon. After that, we click Earthquake four times, and Volkner says it was the best battle that he's ever had. Sure thing, pal. Thanks for the badge. With that, we've made it to the Pokémon League. Yes, technically there is a final run-in with our rival Delta here, but I think it's best to remember Delta as the daredevil that swaggered a scun tank into hitting herself in confusion three times in a row, instead of a sad little man who gets swept by a Glysaur spamming Earthquake. Let's just save him the embarrassment. So here's my final team, leveled up to level 59 to match Lucian's Gallade. We had to leave some gems on the bench, including Air France, who after absolutely smashing the first half of the game, gets to live out the rest of her life in retirement. She'll be here in spirit. Let's see if we've got what it takes to finish this run strong. First up is a Aeron, but his bug types aren't too much of an issue, especially because the level difference between the first and fourth Elite Four members in Platinum is pretty large. Allegiant is able to outspeed and one-shot a Aeron's lead Yan Mega with a Technician-boosted Aerial Ace. Vespiquen comes out next and threatens with a Power Gem, so I switch to Southwest, who just shrugs it off. Then we start setting up Swords Dances, as Vespiquen just goes for pretty much whatever move she feels like. There's not much she can do though, although Defense Order is kind of annoying, especially because we can't hit her with Earthquake. But after three Swords Dances, Rock Tomb is still enough for the one-shot, even after she manages to set up two Defend Orders. Third is Drapion, but Southwest outspeeds and kills with an Earthquake. Then we do the same thing to A. Aeron's Caesar. Last is Heracross, but even though he resists Ground-type moves, plus six Earthquake is way too strong, and he falls, putting a swift end to our battle against A. Aeron. Next is Bertha, aka Surf Target Practice for American. She leads with Whiskash, who does survive a Surf to set up a Sandstorm, but then she goes down on the following turn. All of Bertha's other Pokémon lack special bulk and are very weak to Water-type attacks, so we just knock all of them out with single Surfs apiece. Her Glysaur does have the potential to outspeed and hit a hard Thunderfang, but somewhere along the way, American picked up enough speed EVs to outspeed her. So it's a completely free win for the second Elite Four fight. Third is Flint, who is only marginally harder than Bertha. He leads Houndoom and I lead American, who once again outspeeds and one-shots her adversary with a Surf. Infernape is out next though, and certainly outspeeds and threatens a one-shot with a Thunder Punch. So I pivot to Southwest, who's immune to the Thunder Punch. Then we actually outspeed him and hit an Earthquake. It turns out to not be that great that we outspeed here, because Infernape survives and retaliates with a Blaze boosted Flare Blitz, which could have been bad if he got the critical hit burn combo. But he didn't, so the recoil just takes him out. Magmortar comes out next, so we just kill him with a single Earthquake. And then guess what we do to Flint's other two Pokémon? The Fluffy Pup also goes down to an Earthquake, and then Southwest is even fast enough to outspeed and one-shot the Rapidash, winning us yet another easy Elite Four fight. But fourth is Lucian, who is pretty scary. Nah, I'm just kidding, Technician Boosted Scyther is an offensively good Pokémon, so we are totally fine. Lucian's Mr. Mime goes down to an X-Scissors, before he can even get off a Mime. Lucian brings out Gallade next to it, Stone Edge, but we outspeed, and the Expert Belt Technician Aerial Ace is more than enough to take him out. Espeon is third, and also falls to an X Scissors. Fourth is Bronzong though, and we actually can't one-shot them, so I switch to United on a Soft Psychic. Then I go for a Yawn as Bronzong sets up a Calm Mind. Then I switch back to Allegiant as Bronzong goes for another Calm Mind before falling asleep. Then I go for a Swords Dance on Bronzong's first turn of sleep. This is potentially bad if Bronzong wakes up on the next turn and gets a critical hit with Psychic, but Allegiant doesn't even give them a chance as she just crits an X-Scissors for the one-shot. Pretty savage if I do say so. Alakazam is last, but Allegiant is faster, so an X-Scissors takes him out in one shot as well, winning us the final Elite Four fight. So, all that's left is Cynthia. For whatever reason, I decided that I wanted to kind of wing this fight. No pun intended, actually. It would be pretty easy to lower her Spiritomb's special attack with Captivate from Togekiss, put her to sleep with Yawn, and then set up a Sword Stance sweep with Allegiant, but I wanted to practice kind of thinking on my feet a little, even if it meant risking this entire run. 
So viewers, make sure your seat belts are fastened, your tray tables are up, and your seats are in their upright position, because this landing is gonna get a little bumpy. Cynthia leads with Spiritomb, and I lead with Allegiant. I immediately U-turn for some damage and bring in United, hoping Spiritomb goes for a Shadow Ball. But she goes for Dark Pulse. 50-50 shot there. I go for a Yawn as United tanks another Dark Pulse. Then I go for a Wish as United tanks a third Dark Pulse, which activates our Citrus Berry before Spiritomb falls asleep. I decide to stay in and waste a turn so that United gets back to full HP from his Wish. Then I go for another Wish before Spiritomb wakes up and hits yet another Dark Pulse. Then it's another Yawn. This now has set us up pretty well, because United is back to full HP and Spiritomb is about to fall asleep. So I go for another Wish and tank a soft Dark Pulse as Spiritomb falls asleep. This gets me a free switch to Jet Blue on Spiritomb's first turn of sleep. Then it's just an Aerial Ace, followed by a Brave Bird to finish off the Spiritomb as she stays asleep. This brings in Cynthia's Togekiss, which knows Water Pulse and Shockwave. So I switch first to Southwest on a Shockwave. Then I switch to United on a Water Pulse, which does basically nothing. Then Togekiss outspeeds to hit a Shockwave, and I use Encore to lock him into it. This lets me safely switch back to Southwest and set up a Sword Stance. The only way Southwest can hit Togekiss is with a Rock Tomb, so I go for that, but we miss. On the next turn, I connect with one as Togekiss's Encore continues. So I go for a third Rock Tomb and miss that one as well. A fourth one hits, but it leaves Togekiss in the red. So on the next turn, Cynthia heals, and we miss yet another Rock Tomb. Where have I seen this before? Togekiss's Encore also ends, meaning she now threatens with Water Pulse, so I switch back to United. Thanks to the speed drops from the two Rock Tombs that actually managed to hit, I can outspeed and Encore Cynthia's Togekiss into Water Pulse. I then switch to American. Thankfully, we aren't getting confused here. American then gets a critical hit with Ice Beam, killing Togekiss in one fell swoop. I guess my Pokemon are all just competing for who can land the coolest critical hit. Lucario is out next, so I switch to Southwest on a Stone Edge. Then we set up a Swords Dance as Lucario goes for a Shadow Ball. This activates Southwest Citrus Berry. Then it's just an Earthquake to finish off Lucario in one shot. Milotic is out next and threatens with Ice Beam. At this point, with the end so near, it's time to start making some sacrifices. While it's usually pretty safe to bring an American here, a Freeze from Ice Beam would be pretty catastrophic. So instead, I bring in United, who sacrifices his life so that American can get a safe switch. I know we had a tenuous relationship, United, but thank you so much for all your help in the late game. Rest in peace, you little hustler. This now lets me bring in American, who fortunately is able to hit Milotic with a Toxic. Toxic is safest here because Milotic has Mirror Coat. Unfortunately, American is holding a Choice Specs, so I can't Roost Stall. This means I have to switch to British as Milotic goes for a Mirror Coat. Then I go for a Protect to get some more damage from Toxic. Then it's back to American on another Mirror Coat. I'm not really sure why Cynthia went for it that time, honestly. But now American can just click Surf, tank a fairly strong Ice Beam, and then the Toxic damage finishes off the Milotic. Fifth for Cynthia is Roserade. So I rather hastily switch to British, forgetting that Roserade has extra sensory. Energy Ball and Sludge Bomb should do more damage, but I guess American was in the range to a kill from all three, so it was a random move. Fortunately, British is pretty bulky and survives the extra sensory. So, with a fly, which thankfully connects, we take out the Roserade in one shot. Finally, Cynthia's last Pokemon, her terrifying Garchomp, comes out. At level 62, Garchomp outspeeds everyone on our team except British and Allegiant. So this is a tad scary. I start by switching to JetBlue to get off and Intimidate. He hangs on from a Dragon Rush, which seems to have 100% accuracy when champions use it. I then bring in British as another sacrifice for a free switch in. Cheers, mate. I'm sure there's plenty of tea in the Pokemon Afterlife. This lets me bring in Southwest. Garchomp goes for a Flamethrower, and then we hit a Rock Tomb, lowering her speed. So we now outspeed and hit an Earthquake for a small chunk of damage. And then Garchomp fires off a Flamethrower, bringing Southwest into the red. So it's time for one last noble, and admittedly kinda unnecessary, sacrifice. Southwest hits another Earthquake, procs Garchomp's Citrus Berry, and then goes down to a Flamethrower. So, with that, American comes out, nails Cynthia's Ruthless Dragon with a times 4 effective Ice Beam, and takes her out, winning us the battle and the run. Well, that was quite the trip. It really just flew by. It was plain fun. 
As I said before, flying types tend to have a pretty eclectic number of secondary typings, so these monotype challenges tend to have more resources than most. If you're looking to try a monolock, a flying type one is probably a good place to start. Except maybe an emerald. Watson is really hard. As always, thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And be sure to join the Flag on HG community discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.